During the course of the Pacific campaigns, the Corsairs maintained a loss ratio of over 11 to 1, an impressive legacy even by today's standards. The end of the war coincided with the crossroads in engine technologies. The new jet engines were in and propellers were old hat. War spending budgets were being cut and in an odd twist to satisfy their lend-lease requirements on their planes, the British were forced to dump their F-4Us at sea. Comparing the planes of the day against the Phantom, the Corsair was only 30 miles an hour slower, but had almost twice the range and could carry significantly more load. As a mark of their abilities, the Marines and the Navy kept their F-4Us when most other models were simply scrapped. In British aircraft, this period also had a parallel development from their Hawker Typhoons and Tempests to their pinnacle, the Sea Furies. By the end of the war, most fighters had become bigger and more powerful. These Hawker models used both inline and rotary engines and became very powerful, formidable aircraft. The ultimate development of the line was to see the Sea Fury fitted with a Centaurus 15 rotary engine outputting 2,550 horsepower. The Sea Fury was an outstanding aircraft, a tough customer in the attack role, but with light and responsive controls and excellent performance. Interestingly, both the Sea Fury and the Corsair have proven to be favorites with aircraft restorers today. These Sea Furies were flown in Australia's island state of Tasmania in a recent air show and pylon race. The performance of these planes even today makes them an inspiring sight. Their classic shapes and throaty engines always draw large crowds in the hope of seeing a piece of classic aeronautic history. During the Korean War, there were a small number of reports of the two planes attacking MiG-15 jets. One was of eight MiGs trying to outturn four FB-11 Sea Furies and losing two jets to the propeller-driven plane's cannons. Two other MiGs were damaged, while the Sea Furies returned safely to their carrier. While the F-4U was built heavier to suit the thoughts of the time, the FB-11s were actually a lighter version of their Typhoon and Tempest forebears. In Korea, the carrier attack squadrons of Corsairs and Douglas Sky Raiders were used very effectively in the area of close-in ground support and night interdiction missions. With their large load capability and very accurate close-in ground support, the Corsairs tied up most of the Chinese transport and supply needs. The combination of American aircraft and their carriers gave the US and their allies virtual air supremacy. The Marines' efforts in Korea shine with the merits of the Corsair. The planes handled the extremely basic conditions on the matted strips with ease. The cold, though, was another matter. With the weather this extreme, the planes simply froze up. Even the Chinese could do little when it was this cold. As a mark of their worth, during the first 10 months of the war, the Corsairs flew 82% of the close-in tactical support missions. One squadron flew over 1,100 missions in a month. Corsair's production ceased in December 1952, and by December 1954, all units in service were withdrawn to the reserves. The last Corsair, 
the 12,571st, was delivered in February 1953, and the last operational carrier landing of an F-4U Corsair was made on the USS Valley Forge in 1956. Some other countries continued their use into the 1960s, but their days were obviously numbered, and they were replaced by newer and faster jets as technology finally caught up with them. Vought by this time had also progressed into the jet age. Their first venture was the XF-6U Pirate. However, its performance compared to those swept-wing, higher-powered configurations delivered by the competition was found to be severely lacking. By the time the Pirate was ready to go into production, its successor, the XF-7U-1 Cutlass, had been flying for more than a year. The radical swept-wing tailless F-7U Cutlass naval fighter first flew in 1948, and the first F-7U-3 made its debut in December 1951. The Cutlass again suffered from the problem of being underpowered, though this is probably more a reflection of the state of development in jet engines of the day. Production was cut back in 1954, and it was withdrawn from service in 1957. In the May of 1953, the Vought, now a subsidiary division of United Aircraft, won the new day fighter contract over seven other competitors. The new fighter, the XF-8U-1 Crusader, flew supersonic on its maiden flight on March the 25th, 1955. Vought again used a new concept to win the contest, the variable incidence wing. This new wing addressed the landing problems experienced by the Cutlass. On takeoff and landing, the XF-8U's wing could be pivoted up by seven degrees, allowing the wing to assume a higher angle of attack and thereby lowering the approach and takeoff speed. This also kept the fuselage level and provided the pilot with good visibility. In addition, the raised wing's center section acted like an air brake, reducing landing speed further, allowing greater safety and control on landings. Today, the Crusader has a reputation that is hard to beat. It had outstanding maneuverability, excellent performance, and a very powerful attack. In 1956, the US Navy again called for submissions on an all-weather interception fighter. This time, Vought's entry was the XF-8U-3 Crusader III. During flight testing, this plane demonstrated speeds of Mach 2.2 and an altitude of nearly 90,000 feet. The Crusader III was never flown to its limits because of the windshield assembly limitations. It was thought that without the windshield limitations, it could have reached speeds as high as Mach 2.7 or 2.9 at 35,000 feet. Unfortunately for Vought, the inspiring McDonnell F-4 Phantom beat the plane in the contest. On February the 11th, 1964, Vought again won the proposal contract for a light attack plane to develop the subsonic A-7 Corsair II. It was developed from the supersonic XF-8U, but it was the first supersonic design adopted into a subsonic craft. While the lineage from the F-8U is unmistakable, the Corsair II was in fact a totally new plane. The A-7 first flew on September the 27th, 1965, four weeks ahead of schedule, and was adopted by the Air Force and Navy. In April 1968, the American Marines received their first A-9Ds. These were the first US Army subsonic fighters in 15 years. The A-9 Corsair IIs would fly for almost 20 years, and they were only replaced by F-18 Hornets in 1985. 
The last of 850A7s were retired from the Navy's inventory following participation in 1991's Desert Storm combat operations. These were, for their time, the best light attack aircraft ever produced. Unfortunately, the A7 Corsair series was the last fighter aircraft wholly designed and produced by the company. The achievement over this time, from the first carrier landings to the ultimate in propeller-driven fighters and into the jet age, shows how the Vought company has earned the respect it has achieved over the years. Thank you.